Welcome to lecture five on items. Have you done your homework for the previous lectures? Uh, it is important because these build from lecture to lecture. So what we're going to start to work with now, you know, is based on stuff that you've been doing. Um, so the main objectives of this lecture is related to items. We want to be able to create and adjust the following types of items. Text items and display items, buttons, list items, radio groups, and checkboxes. You'll see there are a number of different choices in the list items. And there are a number of different issues here because, you know, if you have some of these um, items which exclude, uh, you know, you can only have um, something from this list and you can't enter something else, then you also have the possibility that you're querying from the database and it does have a value which is different from that group and you have to decide how to handle that. So basically, uh, text and display items, this is what you've seen up to now in most of your forms that we've created. A text item is usually a database item. It's easily created with the data block wizard. Um, most of the time when you go through the wizard, what you're getting is data block database uh, items, which are text items. Um, and then a display item is something which can be a, dis a database item or not. Uh, or it can be a calculation, it can be created manually. Um, there are a number of different choices here, like you can actually take a database item and make it uh, as a display item, and a display item which means that the user cannot adjust the, the, um, the value that's for that item. It can't navigate in and out of it. And <clears throat> then we also have um, canvases. Now, a canvas is really a property that you have on an item. And this relates to all the items, actually, not just the text items and the, and the display items. An item has to be assigned to a canvas in order for it to be visible. Now, this assignment is something that you do in the uh, property palette. And if you've stepped through the wizard, then the wizard has naturally chosen. You'll, you remember that one of the choices in the wizard of the layout wizard is that it asks you which, um, which canvas you want to put this item on, or this group of items, and so that's, that's already done for you. Uh, there are times where you decide to keep um, the canvas as a null canvas, and what that means by null canvas means that basically the item is not going to be displayed. And you, you may be thinking, well, how come I have these items in my data block um, if I don't actually need to display them? What's the point of that? Well, a very good example is like a database ID, which may, maybe not something that you choose to display to your users, but it is a required value. Remember that your database is assigning a unique ID to every student, and that's the way that it um, knows that there are no, you know, that this student is different from another student. Let's say you've got two, you know, John Smiths. Um, they're brought. They're I don't know father and son, whatever, they're both taking these courses, and you, um, for any reason, you, you can't have two students with the same name, and then uh, they would have a different ID. You'd have another, you know, means of information for determining that. But these also could be database IDs strictly for the purpose of the database maintenance, and it may not be an ID which you want your users to be aware of or even have to deal with. Um, there are times where you know, they're, this is a database design decision. But anyway, if that's what you're, if that is what you have in your database, then that may be something you don't want to display. Remember, by having it in there, uh, when you create a new record, you can also have the initial value set on that item so that it's coming from a sequence, so that as you create more records, they're being given more um, IDs. Another thing, too, is you may need to pull in that value because you're making some kind of calculation, and then you have an item which is displayed, which is a calculated item based on that, so that, that would be another case. So here, are, this is a bunch of, uh, a list of important item properties, uh, which relate, of course, to items, and this is all going to be on your property palette. When you select an item, either in the layout editor or in the object navigator, then you're going to have a list of all the properties you know, over on the property palette. I usually put my property palette to the right, my object navigator to the left, and keep my layout editor in the center. 
um, then it's easy, you know, as I navigate through to see where I'm at. So an important property is required. What a required means that the form on the form level is requiring a user to input a value when they enter uh, a new record, when they want to create a new record. And what this means is that the form will tell you that there is a required value that is required to enter a field there and you haven't entered it. Of course, you know, if you're filling in um, a form for like the student table and the student, uh, the database has a number of records which are required not to be null, then the database will return an error. Now, as I was talking about in the previous lecture, uh, a lot of times those errors are aura, blah, 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 violated, constraint uh, with name, da, 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 da. And that's just gibberish to your users. And, you know, you do not want to have to put your users in a situation where they start to have to write down these long error messages and convey those back to you. You know, like those Dr. Watson errors that are like, you know, module 0754 blah 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 has created an exception fault and you know that gets more confusing to the user and the user starts to think that if they're having problems they've got to write down all this information in order to convey it back to the developers to figure out what the problem is so it's good for you to make use of properties which will give error messages which are meaningful to the user uh, of course you can also handle it with a trigger but in a case like the required value, it's good to, to you know, uh, make use of that one if it is required. Um, another thing that you have is a format mask. Now, what a format mask is, this applies mostly to dates. Uh, well, it actually applies to everything, but the time where it really becomes an issue is dates because, you know, when you enter numbers and dashes or lines, are you entering the month, the day, the year? And remember, when it comes to dates, there are a number of Y2K issues, even though we're past the year 2000, you have to decide how to handle a 00 or 2000 or whatever. And there are some uh, format masks, which include the RR format, which will take like 00 and turn it into 2000. So this is a place where you can do that you can decide how you want to handle that. Another property is database item. Now what database item means is basically you can say that there's going to be a SQL statement which is querying from the base table for that base um, data block with a table that you've based it on, and it's going to include all the items in there that you define as being database items. And then the data type, remember this, this has to do with your, your Oracle database types, like is it a number, is it a date, that kind of thing. Uh, query all records, this would be on the data block level, of course, do you want all the records? Initial value, this is one that I've talked about already here, and this is, you know, um, when the item is first popped up for like a new instance of a new record, um, how many, um, you know, if you, if you want to give it a value, if you want to make use of the sequence to give it a value. Now another thing that, that we have here is the number of records displayed. And this is a value that you would use on, um, you know, like in our master detail block that we made, our master detail form that we created before. And this would be what, um, you know, how many records that you had in there. You can also vary that. Like uh, when I make a, a form based on, say, the grades there, you also have a field which is a comment field, and that's pretty long. And you may choose to have all the other fields, like for the grades, and then leave that common field to cover um, only one record at a time, but have that be big. So it, it is possible that one item in the data block you could have set to one and another one set to four or whatever. And another thing to be careful of, when you create a button, sometimes when you create a button using the tools, um, the the icons on the layout editor, sometimes you'll get like four or five buttons when you wanted one, and you'll see that if the button is in the data block and that block, all of the records there are being displayed like four times, uh, even if the button says like number of records displayed is zero um, or it's empty, it'll actually display the number of buttons as you're displaying records for the rest of the items. So you, you may have to set that back to one. 
canvas, that's something I mentioned before, that's like which canvas the item is going to show up on. Because uh, you remember that a form can have a number of canvases, a number of different parts which appear, disappear, depending on what's going on. And item type, that's what we're going to learn today, is um, the various different types of items, radio uh, groups, um, check boxes, all that. So that's the item type, and that's the property you can change there. And remember also, if you change that item type to display type, that would be um, the same as, as our regular items before, text item, but now it, by being a display item, it means that the user is not able to put the cursor there, and it also means that, um, you know what, it's going to make it kind of gray, and there isn't a lot you can do to control that. So if you really don't like that gray, the gray is like too gray for you, or makes it too hard to, to see, well, not you, remember, your users, uh, then you may be able to, there are some other properties that you can use to control that. Okay, now we're going to run through the rest of the item types. Um, the first one we have is buttons, and buttons is something you're very familiar with. Buttons enable a user-driven event to occur. They mostly have a when button, press, trigger. These are very common buttons, exit, save, cancel. Uh, generally, I advise you to put your buttons in a control block, a, a data block, which is not based on the database, although the form, does not, the form builder does not require you to do that, and you don't have to do that. Um, and there are a number of different considerations that you want to have with your buttons. One thing is you're often going to make those um, by your keyboard navigable no, mouse navigable no means that your focus is staying in whatever item you are, even when you come into the button. You'll, you'll get into that more in the lab, and the demo will we'll explain that more. So now we have uh, three more item types, and these all relate to multiple choice items. So basically we have radio groups, list items, and check boxes. And list items have three different types, a T-list, a pop list, and a combo box. And that really has to do with whether you're giving um, the user the ability to uh, have an additional value that's not in the list or not, or whatever. Anyway, you'll see that when we go into those. So this is an example form. It shows you all the different types that I'm talking about right here, uh, the different multiple choice items. Under cost, we have those three radio buttons. And you can see there's a check box, and then we have that pull down for location, and that's a list item. And I'll explain what each of those mean now. So radio group. A radio group is basically, it's a, um, it's a group of items. It's an interface control that displays a fixed number of options that are mutually exclusive. Each option is represented by that one you know, radio button. And what that means is, for example, we had the three um, different radio groups for the cost of a course, and that means that the course can only have one cost. So you just the user can only choose one. Usually, as a point of advice, we just say that a radio group is a good idea when there are less than five or six choices. Uh, that's just a suggestion because once you get a huge list of radio groups, it starts to get a little confusing to the, to the user because they're all displayed you know, um, on the form. Now, when you create a radio group, you'll see uh, this, this is like a, uh, an image from the object navigator. You can see that like the grade type is related to the database. And when I turn the, radio, uh, the grade type into a radio group item, I now have radio buttons, and I have to make different uh, buttons for each of those. So after changing it to the radio group, you manually create those using the create uh, thing. Then you do have an ability uh, to map other values. Basically, these are values which are in the database which are not represented by the choices. And what this means is that you've created this form for an existing database, and now you've decided that these are the only three values that you have for the cost that you're going to allow. But um, you have to decide how you want to handle that. There may be some old courses in the database that have you know, some other value. And that, that could be that those are courses that you're not teaching anymore, but you still need to compute things for some of the reports that are done. So you have, to, you have this property in the radio group called other values. And you'll see by working through the labs um, that, that this is where you decide how to handle that. So you can, you can leave a blank to disallow other values, or you can map it so that they'll all be forced to go into a new value, whatever, anyway. When you go through the exercise, you'll see that. 
So now we have list items. Remember, we have three different types of list items. And a list item is used to represent mutual exclusive choices. A list item is used instead of a radio group when there are more choices, basically. So we would say when the choices exceeds five or six. Or if you remember that, um, that form that I showed you where we had to pull down on location, if uh, the location is something you've decided to make a list item, um, that may also just be because the screen real estate is limited. And so it could also be a list item for just a few choices. Um, the thing that a list item allows, or should I, I, should wrap, I should say that there is one type of list item which allows a user to enter a value which is not in the list. So here are our basic three types of list items. Now a pop list is a single field is displayed and the user opens the list and you must choose from an element of the list. So there is not, if you give your list item, once you create a list, an item to be a list item in the property, you'll see another property pop up. And that's the type of list item. And if it's a pop up list, then the user has to choose from that list. Now what we call a T list means that it can display more than one at a time. I think this is a little more popular style on the web, but that doesn't mean you can only use it on the web. It's just another list item style, and it means that you can see three or four of the items at a time, even though the user only chooses one. And again, they don't have the option to, to enter something not on the list. And then the final one is the combo box that's similar to the pop list. It looks exactly the same, except one of the choices is blank, and the user can type in a value which is not in that list, and you're allowing them to do that. So that's pretty much when you make up your mind between pop list and combo box. So there are a number of properties to the list items, and these are in the property palette that you have to be aware of. List item and list elements are defined in the list, and that means that um, since there is a fixed uh, number of items in the list, then you have to uh, pop up another little uh, form that you fill out on the on the form builder side, which where you give each element a list. Now you have a choice to the list element is what's being displayed, and then the list item value is what's being given to the database. So, for example, you could have a situation where you um, choose a city and it returns a zip code. Well, that isn't always the best because sometimes you have a number of zip codes for the same city, but, but you get the idea. And the initial value would then be the first value that you see in that list, or like, you know, the default value when, when nothing has been entered or, or the element is empty. And uh, another thing is this other values, which you display this value if the value in the database is not in the list. So obviously this is not applicable to the combo box style. Check boxes, these are pretty simple. These are used for storing a yes, no choice, true, false, on, off. And um, you can also have a trigger which fires when that checkbox is checked so that when you check that checkbox, the when checkbox checks <laughs> trigger is fired and then whatever the code that you have in there continues. So what we're going to do in the, in the demonstration which follows is I'm basically going to walk you through creating these different item types, buttons, radio buttons, list items, and checkboxes. And then you should proceed with your homework as before, and we'll be ready for the next chapter.